You're live. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, July 14th, 2020 workshop session. Uh, and we're going to move right to item number one, licensing of lodging houses. You should have your three panelists momentarily. It takes them a couple seconds to load. Okay, good evening, uh, David, and good evening, Mr. Peters. How are you? Good evening, sir. All right. Uh, Dave, are you going to start this off for us? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, lodging houses, um, if you read the memo and made sense of it, um, congratulations, because this gets a little confusing. Um, basically, we have delegated authority right now from the state to inspect lodging houses. And the types of lodging houses we're specifically talking about are where guests pay for a room, there's a, probably a bed and a dresser, and then they share facilities, basically bathroom facilities, maybe kitchen facilities. I'm not sure that we have any with shared kitchen facilities anymore at this point. Um, the state is looking to get out of the business of licensing those types of establishments. They wanna focus on your traditional hotel, motel inns. They don't wanna do these um, types of lodging houses. You'll see in the memo, um, we referred to these types of establishments as common houses. And that's just a made up term in, in, in part just to try to make this a little simpler because there's a lot of different definitions for these establishments, both within our own ordinance and at the state level. With the state getting out of the business or wanting to get out of the business of licensing these types of establishments, um, two things are potentially um, going to occur. One directly impacts us and the other um, is kind of associated with it. Um, the, the, the one direct impact is, do we want to continue licensing lodging houses in the community? And we'll talk about that. And the second one would be um, the rights of the occupants of these facilities, whether or not they would continue to be treated as tenants or guests. The reference to two different statutes that apply um, to lodging houses or these types of accommodations. One is Title 22, and that's where it views occupants as guests. And, and then that would be your traditional hotel motel inn, and that's where they can be removed or ejected for bad behavior. Um, the other title is 30A, and that's where occupants are get, uh, viewed as tenants, and they would be subject to eviction law. Um, where they would have to go through that legal process to have um, occupants removed. You'll see we referenced um, our definitions of lodging house includes lodging house, boarding house, rooming house, and there's several sections of our ordinance that refer to this that should we make some changes here, we would do some housekeeping and clean things up. But we, we reference uh, lodging houses in the property maintenance code. We reference them in the rental registration ordinance. Um, under business licensing, we reference lodging houses, fire protection references lodging houses, and then the zoning and land use code references lodging houses as well. So there was a bill proposed by um, DHHS to, again, remove lodging houses or common houses from their jurisdiction. Um, that bill didn't get acted upon because of COVID, legislature, legislature, legislature um, has not met since then. Um, our understanding is, and um, Louis can speak to this, Louis Lachance has joined us. He's the code officer who does the sanitation inspections and lodging inspections. Um, he'll chime in here in, in a bit, but um, our understanding is that there seems to be support for this change to occur. And if it does, again, we're gonna be put in the position, um, do we wanna to continue to license these facilities? So we're, we're somewhat being proactive in the sense that we anticipate some changes are going to happen. We don't know when um, this could get put off for easily um, for another year at the legislature because my guess is they have some bigger issues on their plate right now given COVID. Um, but we want to get a sense from you folks as to how concerned should we be. If we, if the state does in fact eliminate the um, requirement to license these facilities, we're of the opinion that we should still have a municipal inspection program. 
Um, Lou can give you some details as to what that might consist of, but it is different than what the state would have would be. Um, and I, actually, that might be a good time, Louie, if you want to chime in as to what the distinctions might be between the two types of inspections. Um, sure. And actually, I'll, I'll even start off by saying, even if this bill does not pass in Maine legislature, we still have a problem with compliance of most of our lodging houses. We have 23 licenses and out of 23, 17 fit into the common house or rooming house classification, uh, not your typical hotel or motel. Um, unfortunately, over the years, these people never, or these licenses never fit the definition for the state and really shouldn't have been a state licensed uh, lodging place Anyways, this probably should have happened a little while ago. Some of the reasons why they can't um, or they don't meet the requirements are just their business model. Um, you go to a nice fancy hotel, you have amenities, you have someone cleaning and disinfecting your room upon um, your request, a daily. Um, they, you generally don't share facilities. A lot of our establishments in Lewiston have shared facilities. They don't provide toiletries, toilet paper, hand wash soap, and that's not all of them, but the majority of them. Um, from my research that I've done, if this bill passes, and even if it doesn't, just because these lodging rooms or common houses don't um, fit the bill, there's over 290 rooms that it would affect, and they're not all single occupancy. We have some inns on outer Lisbon Street that have three and four people in a one bedroom, um, send their kids off to school, receive their mail, use it as their permanent address. Um, so either way, even if the bill does not pass, I feel like we need to uh, come up with our own criteria. Uh, and I really think that just meets general sanitation requirements of common areas, develop a plan that we know that uh, bathroom facilities are being maintained, disinfected. Um, as far as the rooms are concerned, these are long-term rentals and a lot of them decorate themselves, furnish themselves. Um, so I don't know how much we would um, get in depth into their room, but not just shared locations. So Louis drafted up some um, thoughts about what those inspection criteria might be. We're, we're not at a, a point that we're looking to share those, but again, to his point, we're not interested in necessarily getting in the rooms. It's the common areas, make sure that they're clean, they're sanitary. So as we mentioned in, in, the, in the memo, you know, do we wanna have a, uh, a municipal inspection program? And if so, what is its scope? And, and our recommendation would be, you know, limiting that to common areas exterior of the building, basically the health, safety, and welfare of those areas there. What goes on in the rooms is, is really up to the, the, to, to the tenants and let them, let them decide for themselves. Um, there is some question about um, the legal process. I mentioned the two different statutes, Title 14 and Title 30A, for purposes of um, the eviction process or the removal of uh, an occupant from an establishment. We need to, the council needs to be mindful of any changes we make to definitions, how that may impact how occupants of these establishments are gonna be impacted. Um, there's some case law out there and we talked to the city attorney to make sure that we knew what we were talking about here with respect to the implications of how some of these establishments would be determined to be actually a lodging facility or uh, a hotel motel in. But at the end of the day, we need guidance and we'd like to know what the council thinks about as, as to whether or not we want to be involved in disputes between the operators and managers of an establishment as to whether or not they should remain there and whether or not they'll be subject to um, a removal, an ejection, where they're almost like a tenant at will versus um, being a subject to tenant landlord rules where they would be subject to an eviction process, which is a much lengthier process. If you operate a lodging house now and you're a bad character in there, the, the operator, the manager can contact law enforcement and have that person removed you know, 
at notice as soon as law enforcement shows up. And I'm sure Mr. Peters can speak in more detail to that. Um, versus if it's your traditional hotel motel in, excuse me, if you it's your um, regular apartment, there's an eviction process that can take weeks to months to remove somebody from your unit. At this point, we're actually recommending we remain neutral to this, um, we being the city and staff. Um, we don't wanna get involved in whether or not someone, an occupant is um, a guest or a tenant. We don't get involved now. Um, from a property maintenance perspective, when we're inspecting facilities, if someone's going through the eviction process, whether the, the tenant brings it to our attention or the landlord brings it to our attention, it's not our problem. It's a civil matter, and we just assume have it remain that way for lodging establishments as well. There are probably changes that need to happen at a, at a state level, and I think, um, again, Mr. Peters might speak to that, um, but if we're gonna make changes here, we suggest that it really be continued licensing, continue doing the, um, coming up with operational criteria that Louis spoke to about the, the common areas and leave the removal or eviction of guests and tenants to the legislative process and state law. Going through what we think we're gonna see for ordinance amendments, um, we would need to standardize applicable references to lodging houses or boarding houses and rooming houses throughout the code. So we just, there's a, there's a need to do a cleanup through this. Uh, literally, this is probably decades of amendments made to both sections of the ordinance without paying attention to what impacts are being made to other sections. So we need to clean that up. Um, we'd add language that the definition or, or use of the term of rooming house has no effect as to whether Title 30A or Title 14 must be used in the legal process to remove someone. Again, that's, that goes back to the earlier comment about remaining neutral on that. We're suggesting we might put language in there that just makes it clear so there's no discrepancy when we're dealing with landlords, operators, or tenants as to what their rights are. Not our problem. Talk to your attorney, talk to your uh, manager or operator and then adopt uh, operational requirements. So actually come up with criteria, the criteria that the state is using. Um, Louis will draft some criteria to address the, the safety, health, and sanitation of those common areas. I'll quickly note that the Lewis and Housing Committee, um, they met last week. I had a brief discussion with them just about this topic and that I was gonna be talking to you about it. Um, there was some support that um, we should be involved in making sure that lodging house operators um, continue to have the right to remove um, problematic occupants and that we, we should do whatever we can to support that. Um, other folks were concerned about tenants rights, um, that there is a need for lodging houses in the community um, and that we should provide a certain level of protection for them too, meaning that we should continue to license and inspect these facilities. Clearly lodging house is for better, for worse, have a role in the community. Um, you know, there are some rough characters in these places, um, but they do serve as a, a, a go-between for some people where they're um, trying to, you know, get back on their feet again and might not be able to get into an apartment. Um, likewise, it, it's a step up from if there isn't a shelter. Um, but there's, you know, um, I, I think if you talk to people, you'll hear both good stories and bad stories about lodging houses in the, in the community. I guess what I'd suggest is, um, if it's okay with the mayor, um, Tom Peters would like to talk about, you know, some of the implications of the eviction and, and, and um, the, the tenants' rights, and then I can just potentially wrap it up with any questions you guys might have, but what the process might be going forward as well, so you folks understand um, what your involvement may or may not be going um, ahead with any amendments. All right, good, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Peters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Uh, I thank uh, David and Louis for the summary they've given you. I understand we have a limited amount of time, and so I've prepared a, a statement that would help to maybe uh, make it clear what the real issue is here uh, that's going to affect not only Lewiston, but the entire state. Uh, and I'm gonna try to convey that to you so that you understand why we are requesting that the city council convene the legislative delegation to address this issue, because it is going to, it's starting in Lewiston as I'll explain, but it will be a statewide problem. In a nutshell for many years, the law has been clear to remove a tenant 
from an apartment, you would use Title 14. It's an eviction process, forcible entry and detainer. And it requires us to serve a summons and complaint and have the court involved. Generally, this costs about $1,000 with filing fees and so forth, and can take about two months in the process. The law to evict only applies to renting apartments and houses. It doesn't apply to motels and so forth. To remove someone from a motel, a hotel, or an inn, or a lodging facility, historically does not require court action. And under 30A, this type of dwelling can have someone removed by local authorities. This is logical, because if you required an eviction from a hotel type facility, it would take a couple of months potentially and be very expensive and you'd have to be doing it for every single room in that hotel or motel. So in the past, it was fairly easy to distinguish what is an apartment. Those are longer stays, kitchens, bathrooms, etc. What you all know is an apartment versus a motel, which you all would know would be a transient stay, shared facilities, potentially no real kitchen, etc. And that's the type of facility that you were in would dictate how you would remove someone. If they're in a hotel or a lodging facility or an inn, you'd simply remove them by authority. If you were in an apartment or renting a house, you'd have to remove them through Title 14 through an eviction. However, because of recent lawsuits, it's no longer as easy to make this distinction. For example, if you have a hotel licensed by the city as a motel, and that's defined in the Lewiston Ordinance as transient stays, but one of the guests has been there for 10 years, how do you treat the occupant as to removal? Do you have to take him to uh, Title 14 in eviction, or can you simply remove him by local authority? In the city of Lewis and in every city in the state, we have places called lodging facilities. These are licensed by the city by authority granted to the city of Lewis and in all the cities under Title 30A. And these are recognized as not requiring a formal eviction process to remove a person from that place. This makes a great deal of sense because many of these facilities are open to at-risk individuals, people who have been incarcerated, people who have been in halfway houses, coming out of drug rehabilitation, perhaps the mental health institutions. And those folks generally don't have a good track record uh, for renting and don't pass background checks and don't have the funds to pay the higher rent fees for apartments and often don't have necessary security deposits. The lodging houses are thus an ideal way to assist these people in need. However, unfortunately, they often relapse and may begin to abuse substance again, enter into criminal activity, or in some cases with mental health situations, we've seen begin, them begin to threaten other people. Because these fact, of these factors, it is necessary for the owners to have authority to remove these individuals quickly and without need to resort to the timely and expensive court process. It's a good trade for the willingness of an owner to take a chance on a person that others are willing, unwilling to assist. The City of Lewiston has supported these establishments because of the ability to act quickly in the event the individual needs to be removed. Now comes the rub that is the problem and the issue that brings us before you today. Lawsuits have recently been filed in Lewiston to prevent the removal of lodges unless a formal eviction process is used. The suits claim that the dwelling units are really more like apartments and therefore Title 14 laws should apply and the summons and complaint process must be used with the substantial costs and time involved. Remember that motel dweller in the room for 10 years? Well, to remove him would require a Title 14 eviction. However, that isn't where it ends under the new DHS potential rules. Because of the one long-term resident in that, in that motel, that would require Title 14 processes for all dwellers in all the other rooms. The same would apply to a hotel where, the, where there's a long-term resident. For example, a hotel or a motel where an educator visits the city to teach for a year it, and that person has to be removed. That would be now considered an eviction under Title 14 and would require all other rooms to be subject to Title 14 and forcible entry and detainer. Can you imagine if the Ramada had to remove everyone in that way? Um, this issue is real. We have recently been served with a temporary restraining order to not remove someone from a lodging facility 
where the suit claims the person is a de facto tenant and 30A doesn't apply. The suit seeks to negate the local rulemaking authority granted to the city of Lewiston by the state and bases this on a prior case where the court has ruled length of stay is a major factor to distinguish what is an apartment and what is a lodging house. Unfortunately, although the court may convert the room to an apartment for purposes of due process, the city would agree, and I think Dave would tell you, that the designation of those places as apartments would not fit into your code or zoning. They are not apartments. Thus, we are left with a lodging facility that must be treated as an apartment for evictions, but not as an apartment under city codes and can't be treated as such. As a result, and I'm almost done, what the lodging facilities must now consider to do is to limit the length of stay to not exceed 180 days. I picked this number as it is a number used by DHHS in their proposed rules to distinguish between long-term and transient stays. This is not what we would want to do as owners of these lodging facilities. It isn't conducive to mental health or adjustment back to society for those who are at risk and who often use these facilities. But if we are to maintain the right to be able to remove them when they fall off the wagon and they become criminally involved again, to do so quickly would require that we might have to limit their stay to less than 183 days. The city and, and attorney and I have met. I've talked with him about this issue. He agrees that Title 30A is frankly a mess. We have language in those, in those titles that don't make sense anymore and they contradict each other. What we need to do is have the council, I think, convene the legislative delegation so that we can then address what will be a statewide issue and give some kind of clarity to are these places apartments? Are they hotel rooms? Are they lodging facilities? And how do we remove people when it's appropriate to do so? As far as the discussion on overseeing them and cleanliness, we have no objections to all of those kinds of things. People are entitled to have good, clean housing and to be safe and secure. The problem we're presented with right now because of lawsuits that are coming our way through temporary restraining orders is that we have people who sometimes threaten other people and we cannot remove them without going to a forcible entry detainer action. There will be eventually a court case on this, but rather than fight it out in the courts and for the city to lose its authority, granted under 30A, I think the delegation for, needs to get together and the state needs to rewrite some of these rules. It's time to make it clear, how do we appropriately deal with folks who are in these facilities? And, and this will be true for the hotels and motels, any of those places where uh, people are staying long-term they're frankly already violating the licenses they have because they're supposed to be transient stays. So that motel person that's there for 10 years, and these are real cases, by the way, we know these folks. They're technically that place is in violation of its license. And then the question is, all right, if, if we need to remove that person or, or the owner did, how do we do it? And we have to be careful that we don't by accident trying to protect people shut down the state as far as hotels and evictions and so forth. Anyway, I'll be hoping, happy to open up to questions if you have any. Okay, thank you. Dave, anything else you want to add? Um, I, I guess, I, you know, I'd be curious if there's any questions, um, but I, I guess in an attempt to wrap it up, um, Again, at, at a minimum, you know, once we get some guidance from the state, because we we are under the impression this is going to happen, um, and and to to Tom's point, you know, th there there may need be a need for legislative action to occur here. Regardless, at the local level, we are going to need to if they decide to remove their authority from regulating these types of facilities. We need to do some housekeeping on our part as far as cleaning up definitions. We need to come up with our own operational requirements. And as, as Tom's indicated, that's that's not an issue for them. This whole issue of evictions versus um, um, removal of occupants, I, I think I think we're um, involved with that, but I don't think, I, I would recommend we don't get involved from a, from a um, a local 
ordinance perspective. Um, I think that gets handled at the state level and that it's, it, it remains at the state level. What would happen here is we're going to talk to the state as far as process. We would talk to the state to get some more guidance as to where they think they're at with respect to some of these rules. Um, actually, Louis just learned today they have some standard operating procedures that also seem to create some more conflicts and issues with what they're talking about. But ultimately, this is going to be amendments to both the Zoning and Land Use Code and the Code of Ordinances. You folks have jurisdiction over both of those documents. Um, and the planning board just over zoning and land use. So my guess is in the next two to four months, probably, we would be um, coming back with language to both the planning board and the city council, definition changes, operational or licensing requirements for you folks to consider and act upon. Again, we're gonna take some of our lead from the state on this, because we're gonna have to do something at some point, but the level of urgency is gonna be somewhat driven by DHHS and what they actually do. Um, right. Louis, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, not so much except that, I mean, obviously we've, we've, we've already stated this. We do have to do something, um, whether or not the bill passes or not, we need to redefine these rooming houses and come up with our own standards since they don't fit the current definition of state lodging place. Uh, and that's only due to, again, they don't have the practices in place or the standards in place uh, that would generally keep them open. Um, quickly, if we were to go to a hotel and find that a room was out of compliance and there were concerns there, broken glass, uh, leaky faucets, we basically shut the room down. Um, and in that case, in our lodging establishments we have here in Lewiston, we'd be shutting a lot of rooms down. Um, so. We have work on both ends to do, and no matter what, we have to come up with something. Um, if I might, want the mayor, the uh, one of the owners, Rick LaChapelle, is here, as long and Ron LeBlanc as well, another owner of Lodging House. Uh, Rick wanted to ask something or say something. Go ahead, Rick. Um, Mr. Mayor and, and councilors, I appreciate David's uh, stance on it. Uh, they've been working very hard with us to, uh, to review it. Uh, it is difficult to separate the rooming houses without the eviction part of it. This is a devastating blow to the, the industry. Rooming houses traditionally is one step above a shelter. The shelter has the ability to remove somebody when, they're, when there's problems. Rooming houses are very similar. You, in the city of Lewiston, there are well over, I'm gonna say at least 300 rooms well, more than that, if you start con look at the Ramada Inn, uh, Motel 8, you, you probably have seven, 800 rooms in the city of Lewiston that this falls under. I guess we're not asking the city of Lewiston to, um, to make up a separate rule. We need your support and your assistance in gathering our state legislators and seeing if we can craft something that is fair to the tenant as well as to the owners of these facilities to keep and maintain a good facility. Um, so to say that the city should stay out of it is, I appreciate it, but it's, it, you're into it regardless, uh, because these facilities will shut down if they cannot operate in some kind of that manner, because it is going to actually shut them down. So our big question or our what we're, what I, at least I'm seeking for is the support of the city council to get our, dele, our, our legislative delegations together with, in conjunction and say, yes, we support this program um, and we think it's important and particularly for Lewiston. Uh, Portland just had a multi-million dollar uh, project that's coming in, uh, Ron the Blanks here with me. Uh, and these are, these are popping up all over the place. At the turn of the century, rooming houses were very, very popular. The ones that I own, I have one of them on Lisbon Street that's been here for a real long time. I'm going to say 80, 90 years it's been operating. Uh, so this has been, it's in the fabric of our country. It's a fabric of the city of Lewiston. Um, we want to run it professionally, but we need your help. Uh, we have Pine Tree Legal that's coming in and just attacking us on every aspect of the way. And we're trying to provide a nice, safe environment for the rest of the customers. Uh, we have people going off the deep end and 
we have to be able to get them. They're living in a very confined area, and if we allow some people that are very destructive to continue it, it, it just destroys the whole population. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're kind of going, to, going over several things that uh, Mr. Peters went over, but I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, and I, and I did want to clarify. So you're asking the council to, to, well, one, let me ask you this. Have you folks reached out to the local delegation yet by chance? Uh, I haven't, but I think Rick has I've spoken to a too. couple of them separately. Yes. Okay. And you're, you're asking the council that if there's support for any of this measure that we try to pull together and pull them together in a formal meeting, inviting local landlords to be part of that. Uh, however, however you wish to do it, Mr. Mayor, I, I just think it's a statewide issue. It's not just Lewiston. And what we're going to have to do in our places is limit the stay to less than 183 days because that's the designated number the DHS is using in their proposed rule. To do that is not conducive to good mental health and to appropriately be able to stabilize people. But we may be forced to do it unless there's a change in the law. All right. No, I definitely agree with some of your arguments. Uh, uh, all right, so I'd like to turn this over to the council for uh, any questions. And Councillor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think I have three questions um, for Dave. The first, um, this does, does this apply to cooperative housing arrangements at all? No, those are considered multifamily dwellings, so they're apartments. Great, thank you. Um, and then I guess this is just a general kind of clarification question. Um, so, you know, if, if government hasn't sorted this out, what, what do the insurance companies say about liability? How are these units classified differently from motels or hotels? I, I would think, you know, the private sector um, in wanting to turn profit would have made uh, specific rules ar around this and so um, might give us some guidance. I guess that's more of a comment. Uh, and then the third on the legislative delegation, um, uh, portion of things uh, is are there other situations where we've kind of put that forward in such a way I think I don't know I just see them as distinct bodies and I, I, I just don't know if there's previous examples or um, I mean the only, the only thing I can can recall is you know at times a mayor will pull together the legislative delegation with constituents if there's some if there's something to do I, I mean I don't think it would be uncommon for councilors to even do that. I think I did it as council president one time. Uh, so that's that's just my view of that and possibilities that we have that we could choose from. Uh, are you all set, Councilor Ray? Uh, if I could respond to that. Sure. Um, so I think there are there is value in having um, these lodging rooms in, in our community for a number of reasons that were explained, but I think, um, yeah, it may have gone beyond um, being helpful in this community at some point too. So I, I just wonder if there's um, an opportunity to, to work with the housing um, committee and since we have them already established and have them um, advise us a bit more on this work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Pettengill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so not, not really any, any questions, but kind of kind of just some commentary. Um, I'm, I'm never for uh, you know increased regulations, but it does worry me when the uh, state um, seeks to step out completely with it, and that's going to leave uh, the city holding the you know essentially holding the bag with that. Um, I am worried though, you know, again, what happens to this if we don't move forward? Um, with what happens with that when it falls in our lap. Uh, and then uh, more just a question on the feasibility of this, of um, given the state of things and every, everything else that we're working on, do we have the ability to properly do this if it's a, a task that we take on? Because I don't, I don't, uh, I, I do feel that it is necessary, but I don't want to create more processes that we're not actually able to, to do because then it becomes a, a disservice. So we, we currently have delegated authority. We are currently inspecting all lodging places now. So nothing really changes. Um, we'll, we'll continue to do that. 
um, as Louis mentioned, actually with, with the criteria that we would likely come up with, um, it would probably be a better situation for the lodging houses versus the hotel motel inns. Because to his, Louis's point, um, if we held them to the same threshold, um, we would end up closing down a lot of facilities and potentially, you know, putting people out of homes and whatnot. So, uh, I guess to your, your your point, Council, we we certainly have the capacity to continue doing this, um, whether it's because we're doing it now. Anything else, Council of Pendigo? Uh, no, it's good. Good to hear that uh, that we'll be able to continue to to do this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council of Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what I'm hearing here, I think, basically, we do need to approach the legislature and get some clarification on definition. Uh, I dealt with this issue uh, in another state previously, having been in charge of the civil division. Uh, we had a relatively smooth eviction process. There was also an ejection process. Um, if the courts are now legislating these things by definition, uh, and it sounds like we have a real definitional mess in the statute. It's that apparently is not the only place in the statute, but certainly is one of them that's coming forward. Um, I think we have to approach this in the manner that the state has to come up with some definitions first, and then we craft our regulations around them, because the state is going to supersede anything we do. And I think we want to be in tune with them. But it sounds to me like there's something that needs to be done here. I would hate to see the so-called rooming houses, lodging houses, uh, be forced into an eviction process. I'm not sure just how long that takes in Maine for a forcible entry and detainer. I know in New Hampshire, under the best of circumstances, maybe 30 to 45 days. I'm assuming it may take a little bit longer in Maine. It's uh, generally about a month and a half. Okay, so it's it's not as bad as I thought it could be, but still I think that there is room there for uh, uh, the courts to perhaps muck something up a little bit that uh, is, is not intentional. And it sounds to me like we, we ought to be proactive on it. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, no questions for anybody, but I do have some comments. I'm not entirely sure what guidance we're supposed to be giving, but I, I think I can hit it. Um, so um, what was discussed about like the appearance, you know, uh, inspections, cleanliness, that kind of deal, it sounds like that's all being taken care of and concerned. So that's, that's a-okay by me. Um, I mean, I guess uh, in theory, I, I do support the current right of property owners to, you know, uh, make these evictions um, kind of, you know, really kind of why else would anybody even want to operate a boarding house, you know, if they don't have that ability, it just, um, we've got to be able to protect the other, other residents themselves and I've uh, got to keep these places open too. Cause like it's been mentioned, these are often a last resort kind of places for people who have tended to burn their bridges in society. And so we do want to be able to keep them open. Um, so, um, I, I mean, if, if, if it calls for us uh, asking the legis our, our legislative delegation to, you know, meet with us and, and get some work done. I'm okay with doing that. Um, if it comes down to just us passing a resolution saying what we're looking for by the state and then hope, hoping that maybe those changes can be incorporated into whatever state law change happens and then we can adjust our ordinances from there. Um, I'd be supportive of that too. Um, so again, I'm not exactly sure what kind of guidance we should be giving here and I know there's gonna be more information as Mr. Hedegar said in, in a couple months probably. Um, but I mean, if, if we do want to work on some kind of resolution to, to get out to the states when the legislature does come back in to show our support for uh, these you know, lodging houses and their owners, I'd be supportive of that. Thanks. You're welcome. So I think, I think there are two things, Councilor Jensen. I think Dave's looking for guidance on, do we want these, you know, our ordinances and codes looked at and reviewed and updated? Uh, is that correct, Dave? Right, and, and whether or not we actually want to continue to license these facilities with some type of standards. That's, if we're gonna to continue to license them, then we gotta clean up our ordinance and you know get the definitions in order. Great, that's, that's one thing. If we're in agreement on that, that's wonderful. And then the second item is um, to, to Tom Peters' concern, what and how do we approach uh, the, the whole issue of evictions versus um, ejections? And you're saying that would happen in within our code or through 
us working with the local owners at the legislative level the legislative level i don't see that as from a, from an ordinance perspective i don't see us having necessarily a role in that it's 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 going to be something that has to happen at the state level and how you folks if and how you folks decide to approach that is you know up to you okay and if you had any discussions with the anyone from a uh, legislative delegation either separately or staff yeah. hasn't no okay thank you uh councilor Jelinas. I just want to thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just want to mention that I appreciate the comments that were put forth as a result of the um, July 8th meeting with the Lewiston Housing Committee. That was helpful to look over. Um, I'm just trying to get a better idea of how many Lewiston residents we're talking about here. I heard uh, Mr. Hediger talk about you know the fact that there's 23 licenses, um, 290 units, but then I heard Mr. LaChapelle reference um, seven to 800 rooms. So I'm just trying to get, and then at one point I heard that sometimes you know there's three or four people in one bedroom. So trying to, try to get my head wrapped around how many Lewiston residents are we talking about, and has it has it increased significantly over the past year or two, or what does that look like? So I have a general idea of what we're talking about. I think I can comment on that. Um, so my estimate of 292 rooms were based on the 17 licensed establishments that I do not believe would fit the state definition any longer. Um, as far as how many people are in those rooms, um, I do not have a census on that. Um, I do know that there's multiple locations and multiple inns on Outer Lisbon Street that have families in these one bedroom rooms. Um, uh, again, as far as the number that Mr. LaChapelle had given you or Mr. Peters, um, he may not be off. My first guess was close to 700 rooms. Um, and as far as how things are progressing, um, Mr. LeBlanc and Mr. LaChapelle have, have actually built uh, facilities and they're increasing the numbers of these rooms. Um, we do have zoning standards, so it's not like they can keep expanding and expanding, um, but we're on a trend where the, new, the rooms are um, increasing. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. All set, Councilor Jelinas. All right, Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just um, two questions and a comment. Um, First, I think we should always, you know, update our ordinance and code. So I'm definitely for that, looking looking to update that. Um, and, and second, I don't think we should be involved. If, if we're not right now involved in any legal matters, I don't think we should be. Um, and one question is, have, have other municipalities started this conversation um, or have they taken any action, um, their city councils or their boards or anything like that? Louis, how many other communities have delegated authority? There's three other communities, Auburn, Portland, and South Portland. Um, Portland, as of date, I don't believe they have lodging licenses. That's correct. Uh, it's only state licenses. Um, I have not gotten a feel from South Portland or Auburn. Um, I know Lewiston is a community that would be affected greatly by new rules. When, when I first started talking with Tom Peters and, and Rick LaChapelle, um, I actually did call Portland out of curiosity and, and Louis right, they don't license them right now. Um, they feel that there's a need to, um, to, to, to address what Louis and, and, and Rick have done there's a demand for them. Um, there, there, there's, there's just a, appears to be a need for them and Portland is trying to figure out how to, how to address that right now. Yeah. Um, why I ask that is maybe because, you know, Portland, South Portland, these other communities can also talk to their state delegate because I mean, Lewiston state delegate is just so small and, and at the state how there's so many representatives. So I feel like the more um, state delegate that we can bring together, the better. But other than that, thank you. You're welcome, and you're, I agree with you, Lewiston's delegation is small compared to Portland's, but Lewiston has a well-known influential delegation. Yes. Uh, so we're fortunate in that respect. Uh, Councilor Clement, anything, oh, I'm sorry, anything else, Councilor Clee, are you all set? Okay, thank you. Councilor Clement. 
and you're on mute. The sticky mute button again. I don't know what gives it here. Um, to Mr. Hedegaard's point, I believe we should license these establishments. I think it becomes a matter of public safety. Um, if there is nobody overseeing them, if the state's going to give it up, and we're not overseeing or licensing them, then pretty soon there's going to be some type of disaster. And uh, I just think we want to avoid that. I think we owe that to residents of the city that we do our best to provide them with, uh, with safe housing. I mean, I've been involved in a number of these places, and I'm sure you have, Mr. Mayor, where the conditions are just uh, basically intolerable. And I, I think we need to avoid that if at all possible. I thank you. You're welcome. So, you know, room and houses are definitely a double-edged sword in any community, but uh, I would agree that it's a step up from a shelter, uh, and there is currently a significant need in our area, uh, and I think that's, you know, been evident through this, the uh, pandemic. All right, so I, I guess the feel that I'm getting, and counselors, please go, Councillor Ray, you always put that up at the last second. <laughs> go ahead, Councillor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It has been up, but I believe Councillor Pattengill was before me. Go ahead, Councillor Ray. Okay. Um, so uh, from here, Dave, can you remind me of what you said the process might be? So um, just purely on the local level, we'll need to look at our language. It'll involve changes to both the Code of Ordinances and the Zoning and Land Use Code. So a portion of this will require a recommendation from the Planning Board. And then that section, as well as the code of ordinances, would require hearings by you folks. So, um, you know, two public hearings, typical amendment process that we go through where we're showing you existing proposed language. And again, I don't know. I mean, we'll get a little bit of guidance from the state, but this could happen in two months. This could happen in four months, depending on if um, this delegation discussion goes further. Um, one of the counselors mentioned that, you know, maybe we need to wait to see what the state does so we can piggyback on that. So there may be a delay depending on what happens at that level as well. I'm very curious to hear the planning board discussion and recommendation. So um, helpful to hear it. We'll go through them. Okay. Councilor Pentgill, do you still have a question? Uh, no, just more a uh, more a, a comment to kind of go along with Councillor Clement. Um, in a, a, a past career, um, when I worked in rent to own, um, I've been in many of these establishments. Um, and honestly, and anything that we can do to make housing safer uh, for the people that reside in these places is is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I'm hearing generally that we'd like code, uh, David's department to kind of look at code and, and uh, go in the direction that was suggested. Is that a thumbs? Yes? Okay. And then assisting uh, some of the local landlords with uh, a legislative delegation. I mean, I don't mind doing it. Uh, maybe with Council President LaJoy, uh, or would the council like to do it as a whole? I need I need some chipping in on verbally here. I'm fine with you and um, Council President, but okay, Lou, yeah, Mr. Mayor. Alicia. Okay, Alicia, thoughts? I think that's fine. Okay, I saw some other nods. Okay, uh, are you okay with that? Uh, Mr. Peters and Mr. LaChapelle, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the other gentleman's name. Mr. LeBlanc, uh, more, than, more than pleased with it, and we will happily hold ourselves out to assist in any way we can. Remember, there are two different things going. One is the standards for health and safety, which you're talking about, and the other is the eviction and removal issue. The eviction and removal issue really needs to be the state level because they've usurped that part of, of the process. It's state law that controls how we remove people and it's local control under 30A that lets you set the standards. So we have no problem with, with working with you folks at all on that. All right, and the, uh, the statement that you read, could you get a copy of that to uh, City Administrator Dote just so that we have that on record and so that counselors could look at that again? Be happy to, yep. Okay, and then if you could just reach out to uh, Dottie and set up an appointment anytime, maybe next Monday or Tuesday, 
we can start with that. Would that work? Um, is Dave, are you going to be involved with that? I think, uh, let me check, you know, I'll, I'll have a conversation with our city administrator, but just set up an appointment with Dottie, you know, for me, and then I'll reach out to us, you know, our city administrator will reach out to you and kind of set up the parameters. That worked. Okay. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're going to be switching to uh, item number two, and uh, Dave, stay right here with us, and we'll bring in Doug. So I'm not going to talk this time. I'm going to let Doug do all the talking, and you know, I'm, I'm just his backup in case something happens crazy. So this is the Doug we show. Have, we have okay. about 20 minutes, Doug. Okay, I will uh, just just use every other word. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody, and we're really. David and I are very pleased to be able to present uh, the design Lewiston. I think we had a workshop quite a while ago, but we want to update you and show you, discuss the final draft. Uh, we had a presentation with the planning board last night. And I wanted to give you, take a few moments before we get started uh, to talk about uh, some background and the purpose of this project so you get a better context with what this is about, what we're looking to accomplish with this project. And if I could, I would like to share screen and I'm just going to go ahead and use the share screen to show the, the draft and illustrate some of the, the mapping and some of those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Okay. So if you're seeing that now, hopefully you are. This is, this is the cover of the Design Lewiston. It's a site plan review design guideline standards for the city of Lewiston. Um, the major goal that we're looking for is to promote quality, attractive development in Lewiston. And if I could just take a moment to ask the question, well, why do we need to do this? Why do we want to have this document uh, in effect? Right now, there is an existing site plan review and design guidelines, but it's 30 years old. It's not being used really effectively at all. And the planning board, uh, as they make their decisions, really has no discretion on design type issues in, in their decision making process. Um, our comprehensive plan and our River, River Island master plan recommend that there be uh, new design guidelines or standards that would be adopted that would help uh, create better quality development in the future. So uh, there was a consultant selected and an advisory committee worked for about nine months to put together uh, this draft that you uh, see before you. Um, this is one of the major themes that I want to keep uh, to your attention is there are two major areas that the design guidelines, Design Lewiston uh, project really addresses. One is citywide design guidelines that's going to be in effect for the entire city. These are guidelines, which means that they're recommendations, they're not strict rules that have to be followed uh, in order to be approved. But the design guidelines has, you'll see, has lots of information that uh, address uh, common development issues and hopefully that these recommendations will provide for better development. The other part of this is design district overlay standards. And those standards that are gonna be new rules in place if adopted uh, would be in effect in our downtown core. The advisor, advisory committee felt very strongly that um, there should be absolute standards that developers have to follow, but they wanted to make sure that this was another, another overriding goal, that the design standards, the rules would be simple, that would be based on traditional architectural standards, things that are normally used, you'll see in our downtown even currently, but it also would be something that are going to be helpful for the future. Um, again, for development and in the downtown area. The, um, the design guidelines uh, are gonna be required to be addressed by development of, uh, of applications. Uh, currently, the applicants have to address all these list of things that you see on your screen right now. I don't wanna get into those things, but. Uh, we're gonna, we want to make sure that planning board is going to want to see that developers at least are aware of this, these guidelines and that they're going to have to 
at least acknowledge that they've uh, seen them and uh, explain why or why not they're, they're being used. The citywide design guidelines uh, cover things like site layout, uh, building placement, parking lots, layout. Um, the guidelines also are making recommendations on buffering and screening. We want to make sure that uh, commercial type use, mixed uses are separated by buffers when it's appropriate from residential areas. So there's not a conflict of uses. Uh, there's recommendations on the buffer design, how they're going to be, how they could be utilized, whether it's fencing or planted areas or berms. Um, there also are recommendations on designs, uh, landscape designs. One of the things that we are going to be uh, looking to do with the uh, program, the design standards, is require that parking lots along major commercial corridors would be screened or have more street trees. We think that's going to be at least one area citywide that we will be asking for a little bit more from developers. Um, again, more about landscape design. There's going to be recommendations on parking areas that for larger parking lots, there'll be safe walkways that will get uh, allow people to get to and from their cars to the businesses and to the sidewalks and streets. And then some basics on lighting. Um, we also are encouraging all development to consider adding site amenities, things like benches, uh, courtyards in the front, uh, bicycle racks, waste, waste receptacles, things that are just going to make uh, a more pleasant atmosphere for people to uh, visit these businesses. And then some basic uh, examples of the kind of things that uh, we're asking developers to consider when they make development happen in the citywide area. The next part is the design district overlay standards. And there was a lot of discussion uh, among the advisory committee and the consultants and staff about where the design standards should be in place. And again, there's going to be the design districts, as you can see here, are going to be along our riverfront zoning, our mill district, the Centreville, and then our downtown residential area. The overriding themes and goals of the design district is to preserve uh, Lewiston's heritage by encouraging infill development, uh, re reusing historic buildings and protecting historic buildings. We want to encourage infill development, like I mentioned, and the overriding theme keeps coming up about encouraging quality development, but not making these quality uh, recommendations and, and uh, requirements to be extra cost to the developers. We really are very cautious and, and uh, cognizant of that during this process. And then last goal for the, uh, the development, uh, the design districts, excuse me, is to foster a safe and pleasurable environment that encourage, encourages pedestrian activity. We want to make sure our downtown area uh, increases its walkability and makes it more pleasurable when we can finally get out and get around to be able to enjoy our downtown and get down to the river and all those nice areas that uh, we have to offer to our businesses and to visitors and to our residents. The design district uh, overlay standards uh, shows an example here of things that um, has, have come about without having design regulations, things like parking lots along the street, one-story buildings in our downtown, uh, empty vacant lots that really should be encouraged to be development, lack of street trees and landscaping. The design standards will encourage more uh, de development and design that is uh, promoting clear uh, doorways and where entrances are better landscaping along the streets with street trees and landscaping and development that's going to meet building standards that are traditional and attractive. Uh, so I'll run through some of the basics of the design standards. Again, these are going to be uh, also in the form of a text amendment uh, that was included in the back of the design guidelines and that would be the actual standards that the developers would follow uh, as far as a regulatory part of the zoning ordinance. But there's a series of requirements 
on exterior building standards. They're separated out between commercial building standards and residential building standards. Um, things like we want to encourage, or we're gonna be requiring, excuse me, commercial uh, buildings in our downtown area to have 50% uh, window coverage along the first floor. That's very traditional uh, along Lisbon Street. That's what you would see. The upper floors would be required to have 25% of their building facade to be windows. There are also our standards for residential buildings uh, in our downtown area, also the design district overlay area. Uh, traditionally, residential buildings in a downtown setting will be elevated at least two or three feet. We're gonna be requiring that residential construction, new buildings would, for residences would be up 21 inches, which is equivalent to three steps up. And that would also create uh, windows on the first floor that are out of the view for the most part of people walking along the streets. That's why that really is a logical situation. And then also there'll be requirements for 25% uh, window coverage on the upper floors. One of the things that came up, I'll just mention quickly, is on windows. Uh, there's been a lot of comments through the advisory committee and from other, other folks as much as we're, we're appreciative and happy about the Hartley block and new residences being put in our downtown mixed use commercial on the first floor, there has been some comments on the windows, for example, being flush with the walls of the, the facade. And so the recommendations going forward will be for windows to be either recessed or to have some type of architectural surround to add some more interest to the design of these buildings on the outside. There's also uh, a regulation to prevent large amounts, spaces of blank walls along our street frontages. We don't wanna see blank walls, we wanna see activity. We wanna see windows and doors and, and interest in a building, not just blank walls. There's re regulations uh, in the downtown over in the, excuse me, the design district overlay area for parking design and where the parking lots would be located, not along the street. We're also going to be adding requirements for, especially in residential infill development, to leave space uh, maybe at least five feet along these buildings in the street to allow for uh, gardens and plantings and street trees along the front yards of uh, new construction, new infill development. Uh, there's going to be some basic requirements for roofs and then probably the most important thing in the design district overlay is going to be what's called context sensitive design. And we basically are utilizing what is currently in existence in our historic districts for design, uh, design requirements for historic development in a historic district. And that requires uh, that there would be compatibility to the surrounding buildings. And so that's, we're gonna be using that in the design district overlays as well. That's already in place and we can just use it in this setting. It's gonna require that the developers have to present a narrative and document buildings surrounding uh, the proposed development site and have a narrative describing how this proposed development will fit in in some form or fashion to the surrounding buildings. And we think that's going to be compatibility uh, is really important in creating quality development. So things, new things uh, will fit into the surroundings. Uh, moving along, then the last part of the design guidelines also has some graphic uh, depictions of how we regulate building location, whether they're setbacks or whether they're going to be yards or the heights of building, things like that. And we think this is going to be a much more user-friendly way to uh, have developers understand where buildings need to be placed and residents can understand the same thing. And uh, this is gonna be a graphic format to uh, help people understand how the new development will be placed on the ground. So I've moved along pretty quickly. Uh, one other thing I did wanna mention that there are two of the downtown, the design district overlays 
the downtown residential district and the riverfront district. We're gonna be uh, recommending that the lot size be reduced from 5,000 square foot lots and 50 feet of lot frontage down to 4,000 square foot lots and 40 feet of frontage for both of those two zones. And we've done some mapping exercises where we found that there's a number of currently undevelopable lots because they're undersized lots that this uh, relaxation of those lot standards will allow some infill development on properties that are undevelopable right now. We think that's gonna be a good thing. And that ties in with one thing that um, I'm kind of transitioning into the last part of my presentation is what happens next. Um, we're working with the planning board, like I mentioned, and we'll be having a second workshop with them on July 27th, where we'll be presenting additional text amendments that support all of these things that we've been working on and presented today and tonight and with them yesterday. And then also we're proposing a zone change in the Tree Street area. And I'll be glad to discuss that later on, but we think that's gonna unify the Tree Street area as they're moving into their transition plan. It's gonna create more opportunities for infill development. And we're excited about that. Uh, down the road, um, we're looking to have the planning board make recommendations on these text amendments and the zone change that that would be moved on to you, hopefully in August and September. And then hopefully uh, as things move forward in a good way, September we would be asking the city council to make adoptions of the, uh, the text amendment that supports these design standards and then also the zone change for the Tree Street area. So covered a lot of information in a short amount of time. I hope you had a chance to look over this information and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. All right, thank you. Uh... And, and, and I will share, I mean, I, I'm sure every counselor read through this document. I found it quite interesting. Uh, do you have any thoughts on development cost increase because of this, uh, because of these suggested changes? Um, I will have to tell you that um, there's, there's a balancing act that we were aware of the whole time. And I can tell you that I worked on Auburn's form-based code to help them get that started. I've reviewed form-based codes all over the country. And this is about as simple as you can get. So I think the major changes that would uh, have some impact on possible costs would be the asking developers to present some elevation drawings of their projects, which in today's uh, computer driven development, that's not too hard to come by. And a little more uh, time to develop a narrative, which is just time and explaining and addressing the things that need to be addressed. So um, we're not asking for a lot. We feel like we're things, simple things like uh, doors in the front of buildings and some uh, window space along the first floors for a commercial space. That's what's been done for a hundred years. And we just want to continue that type of development. Uh, we want to discourage uh, low cost development that, that dodges simple design factors like large amounts of, of blank spaces that's along street frontages, things like that. So we've done everything we can to keep costs down for development. And we want at the same time to make new development attractive and something that we're all proud of. Okay. And if you can drop that screen down just so I can see all the councilors. Yes. Thank you. For <laughs> no, okay. to, thank you. Uh, yeah, Councilor yeah. Pattengill. Wow. Uh, I, I can't say enough good about this. Honestly, thank you to everybody that had a hand in this. This is phenomenal. Um, I'm going to jump all over the place because my notes are just as erratic. Um, I love everything about this. I love page 19 in its entirety. Um, I love the fact that you have recommended tree plantings in the back. Um, and honestly, the attention paid to something as simple as window dressings um, is phenomenal. Um, that something, you know, that minute showed up in uh, somebody's comments and it was pointed out. Um, this got better and better with every page that I turned. Um, 
paying attention to the lot sizes uh, that you talked about uh, at the end so we can get more infill development uh, in the older parts of the city is only going to benefit us. Um, uh, two more things that I'm done. Um, I hope over time uh, that we can uh, encompass more areas of, of the city because if, again, these, these standards will benefit us. Um, and then to the mayor's uh, question that he just asked about whether or not this will have uh, increased developmental costs. Um, while it is a worry that uh, doing this may scare off developers, this is only going to benefit us in the long run. Um, this is a very, very good plan. Um, I'd love a hard copy of this um, that wasn't presented with, with it. Um, but I like it that much. So honestly, from the bottom of my heart, Thank you to everybody that worked on this and had a hand in it. Great job, guys. So you really okay. like this, Council of Pagan you're not being around. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> and Zach, we did make uh, color hard copies. I guess that hopefully it's in your mailbox if you were able to get there to see that. So. I, uh, you know, Thank I you. as well liked it. I do have a concern about increasing development costs. Uh, and I also have a concern about streamlining the process for developers. So. I think I would ask that you just, you know, you think about that as you move this uh, plan forward through the planning board. I think if it's gonna increase, increase development costs at all, even slightly, uh, we should be considering ways to streamline the process to make up for that so that developers don't walk mm -hmm. away. Uh, yeah. But and overall, can... our historic uh, character in our city, all real, real important stuff. I think trees, real important. The barrier is real important. But we should try to find ways to kind of make up if there are going to be additional costs. Right. And, and Mayor, I appreciate your co uh, comments on the review process, streamlining things. David and I talk about uh, that on a regular basis. I didn't mention it because there's so many parts and pieces of this that support all this. But we've also are creating online applications for development that uh, it's, been, it's been my experience in the two and a half years I've been here that it's, it's not a simple process. And while it could add a week or two because of confusion and how to actually submit and what to prepare for an application, we're, we're working on making it very uh, simple uh, on our application process that you can do it online. There's links to all our zoning ordinances. There's links to mapping to help facilitate creating an application more quickly. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Great, thank you. Uh, any other uh, counselor, Ray? Thank you. Um, Doug, is there going to be a public comment process and period for this document you've presented tonight? Well, we've updated these, uh, the area on the planning and code enforcement website. So it is available for the public to view now. Um, there'll be a public hearing process through the planning board that's required. And uh, we've been reaching out to the advisory, advisory committee to bring them back up to speed. They've been kind of dormant like a lot of things for a number of months. But we certainly encourage any and all folks to take a look at this. Um, we're open to any ways to get this, get this out there. And uh, maybe we're talking to the, uh, the Sun Journal, getting making sure that everyone's aware that this is coming to conclusion we want this is the time to get that type of feedback if you could just keep us apprised of that timeline um, as the process moves forward i expect constituents will want to weigh in as well very good okay council Gelinas. just a quick shout out to mr green and everyone involved um, with this document i did have a color hard copy to look at and uh it was just a pleasure to look through. I really, there's a couple of things that I really loved. Um, you know, the whole concept of, of like the no blank walls, for if it's greater than like 15 feet, I loved that. As an avid cyclist, um, I really appreciated the section in there that talked about having um, racks for bicycles uh, when a building was such a size. Um, you know, there's just a lot of little touches in here that really um, were awesome. So I just want to say great job. Thank you for this. Thanks. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with uh, Councillor Pettengill's comments on this, as well as Councillor Genlinus. Um, anything that is going to benefit the appearance of the city is going to help us in the long run. I also hear your comments about uh, the cost of development. 
to which uh, a couple of things. First of all, I don't know that Lewiston does this, but it's an idea to consider. Um, in another jurisdiction, we had what we call the bi-weekly committee, whereby everybody involved with development, be it the code enforcement, be it, uh, in this case, it was a sanitary district, water district, uh, all of these various entities, fire department, police department, we sat around at the table, invited the developers in, and they got a chance to hear at one place everything that was going to be required of them. They didn't have to, well, you could have got down to the office on this street to talk to them. Uh, yeah, maybe you go over here and talk to them. No, they had it at one shot. So they got uh, a very healthy dose of what was going to be required in a minimum amount of time. And I think that's something we might want to consider here. Uh, and to the point about the cost, if a little bit of cost keeps a less than desirable developer from doing something that's going to be to our detriment, then so be it. I think we want to we want to do what we can to improve the appearance uh, of the city and make it uh, more desirable. And to that end, if it, if it costs a little bit uh, to keep some of these uh, developers out there that have a less than ulterior motive, then so be it. That's that's all I've got to say on the subject. Thank you. And I appreciate your comments, uh, Councillor Clement, on the uh, the committee process. So David and I can talk more about that. Yeah, I, I think it's a great thing. It worked very well for us. Uh, the only problem, I guess, would be that we started out with uh, very few people. And by the end of my time with this committee, which was probably four to five years, I think the mailing list got up to the point where it required almost two pages on, a, on an email to invite everybody. We just kept inviting this entity and that entity. But if you do it with the idea that those that have uh, direct impact on development or uh, requirements that the developer has to meet and get them all together so they can understand all at one time and ask questions and the various uh, authorities have a chance well yes that would apply in this case but not if you're going to go with you know it just it removes so much of the uh, the running around and, and red tape and I, I think it was a wonderful thing and we heard very positive comments back from developers I do, I do believe we actually do that though, right? We have that staff review process. David? Yes, we do. Um, it's, we make it available nearly to everybody who goes through the development review process. And um, we are basically scheduled to meet any Thursday, basically all the departments, planning, code enforcement, public works, police and fire are available and basically they reserve that time off on Thursday mornings to, to meet with developers. So um, that's our approach as to at least getting it on the development review side. We do that in part so we can let them know about all the scary things that are going to happen. We can learn about their project as well, trying to iron out any wrinkles ahead of time. Um, and, and it generally works well to the point that um, if you talk to um, other consultants, and I, and I don't know that people in Lewiston necessarily appreciate it, but project representatives who come to Lewiston to represent Lewiston projects, um, we get people through the planning board usually in one meeting. It is rare that we go to two or more meetings. Um, that is not the case in many communities. And when we can spend a little more time with them on the front end so we can get a project approved quickly at the planning board, um, we know that they appreciate it. They, they let us know that. Um, honestly, I don't know that people in Lewis and appreciate that because <laughs> they don't recognize that in a lot of communities, the process can be very onerous. Um, so, um, but your, your point's well taken, uh, counselor, that um, certainly we can always look to make that a better process. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from councils? All right, thank you very much, Doug. That was a great presentation, and especially the written document that I saw, that was really well done. Much appreciated, and thank, thank you, you, Dave. Thank you much. All right, we'll move to uh, item number three, uh, and it'll be Dale and Jason, I believe, presenting. You're on mute. Jason should be with us shortly. Okay. Jason, are you there? 
you're on mute. Hello? Hello? There you go. Hi there. Do you have some video, Jason? I do. Let me I share, do. My, Let me screen. share my screen. Yeah, and you have some uh, feedback. Uh... Jason, I would, I would mute your, your uh, computer. You're getting, you're picking, your mic is being picked up by both your phone and your computer. So while Jason's loading it up, we're kind of going to go through um, a little bit of um, fairly recent history with the um, last couple decades of, um, of Lewiston Recreation, kind of what the history's been. Um, then he's going to move into um, kind of some strategic outlooks um, for recreation. And then thirdly, we'll end with um, kind of how our forecast is this fall, depending on how, how COVID goes. So I'll pass it over to Jason. Can you guys hear me better now? Yes, thank you. And we see your video clearly. Thank you, Jason. Sure. Um, glad to be able to come here and present virtually with you guys. Um, we're going to run down, like Dale said, some of the, the history, um, what we're hoping to do in the future, and, and definitely hear some feedback from you guys, what you'd like to see as well. Um, quick little rundown. Uh, I've got this article up in my office. It says uh, 50 years ago in, in August, so we're we're coming up on our 20 or 67th um, year of full-time recreation. Um, 1973, the multi-purpose center was built. 2008, parks went to public works. 2013, the multi-purpose closed and seniors moved over to the armory. Um, 2014, some, some major staff cuts, uh, maintenance cut. And then 2020, we had the, everybody knows what's going on this year. Um, just a little sheet showing how, how recreation staffing levels have gone. Um, just want to make sure everybody, a little point for this is that um, the less staff is funded through operating, um, that the higher costs would have to be to the public for each program. All of our programs are offset by the rec activity funds. Um, they, they fund themselves. There's no taxpayer dollars that go directly into those. So anytime, any any time that we get um, staff from operating, we can decrease the cost out to the public for each program. So having having us cut down to the the two and a half full time with no programmers, all of the all of our staff for activities are going to have to be funded for each program. So that has the potential to increase costs to the public, which is not something we really like to do. Now I'll just kind of run down through what we do. We uh plan and create UF activities at uh, 1,360 participants for FY19. Um, that's probably the date I'm going to use most of the time because this past fiscal year kind of got split up and broken up in March. It's hard to tell what we actually had. Um, these are some of the programs we run. We are operating most of those still. We schedule all the reservations for all the athletic fields. Um, so I work with the, the high school athletic director, middle school athletic director, and then all of these organizations were just from last year. Um, bringing on the, the new turf fields was a, a huge, huge skit for us to um, have at Lewiston. Um, so now we have just phenomenal fields that everybody wants to come use. Um, the MPA is usually trying to get there for um, various championships. Um, I work close with Mr. Fuller trying to get – there's so, so many organizations that are really trying to get onto that turf time. So this takes up a huge, huge portion of my time um, just, just scheduling these fields. Um, we work really close with the Public Works Open Space Division to make sure they're aware of everything that's going on. Um, we've just recently integrated into our new registration software. So when I make a reservation, um, I can click a little extra button and tags um, the, the um, field crew so they'll know when there's a new um, reservation coming out. That way they won't have to be looking at the calendar all the time. They can just, they'll get an email, it'll pop up, make things smooth and simple. Um, so the, the calendar for all these events is publicly available. Anybody can go view it and see what's going on on all the fields. Um, we've been trying to be as open as we can. I know we always have difficulties with people trying to res reserve time on the fields. So one of the things we've done with the new registration software is I made the calendar open. So anybody can go look and see what's going on in the fields at any time. And they can you know, see if it's scheduled, if it's reserved, if it's not, and then they can 
give us a call, give us an email, go online. They don't have to talk to us. They can just go online and, and schedule time if they want. Uh, another huge thing is we have the, the armory. Um, we're really, really proud of all the work we've been putting into that building. Um, it's, uh, it's a building dedicated to Lewiston's veterans. Um, we're, we're definitely really proud to have all those veteran groups that hold their meetings in our building. Um, there's usually one or two a week in normal times. Um, they have their own space. They come in, they set up, they, they're, they're great to have in here. Um, our, our gymnasium is now one of the premier facilities in central Maine. As you can see, it was booked almost 80% of the days this past year. Um, almost 50% of the hours that we were available after school time, it was, it was booked up, uh, most weekends it's filled. I'm already starting to get AAU groups just now that we're starting to reopen. Um, I got I've gotten plans from some organizations, um, we could have the gym filled already um, all weekend in September, October, already before we even really started to open it back up. Um, one of the things that I've been looking to get uh, for that gym is a uh, gym curtain divider. Um, that would make our facility um, even easier to hold some, some bigger events. We could split our court. We have two high school regulation courts inside which is very rare. Um, nobody usually gets two full courts inside a facility. There's not many in the state that have that same capacity. And then we also have the elevated seating, which I'm not sure anybody has that. So we have a unique facility with some great opportunities to, to fill it with even more, um, even more organizations. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things we've been working on is all the meeting room spaces around the building. Um, as they become more vacant when the school left uh, a couple years ago, we immediately went in there and got to work uh, painting, getting everything um, renovated. We used it for our summer camp last year, and it was wonderful to have so many different breakout rooms. Um, the past couple of years, our summer camp numbers have doubled each of the past years. So before we got into COVID, we were looking to have another huge year expanding into the other side of the building. Uh, we've also hosted the uh, main recreation and parks fall works up the past couple of years. It's kind of a, a pilot program to show that we could hold those one day workshops and trainings. It's just another opportunity that we have to bring in more revenue. Um, if we can market our building as able to hold easy, easily uh, 60 to 100 people, small conferences and workshops, we can do that with, with no problem in that building. That's all set up and ready for it. Uh, one of our greatest accomplishment so far is just being able to bring the community and working with groups back into the armory. Um, prior to prior to me taking on the, the role of program coordinator and then superintendent, um, a lot of organizations were turned away before they even got the chance to, to come in the doors and sit down. And we are really proud of how we've opened doors and started relationships with a lot of these organizations on here. Um, one of the ones we've done the past year is working with Yes Basketball. So we have always run the grade school basketball program through all the elementary schools in Lewiston for fifth and sixth graders. And prior to last year, each school would put in like one to four teams made up of only their school. Um, they'd come to the armory and they just play games. And it was, it was easy to tell the divide amongst some of the schools and it created some pretty heavy rivalries. Games got really intense. It just, it was just creating a divide. So we worked with Yes Basketball. Um, this past year, we got rid of the games. We brought in um, all of the schools came in, um, boys on one day, girls on another day. They all were taught the same exact skills. They were all given a basketball. We brought everybody together um, and it worked out um, phenomenal. Um, all the kids were, it was just exciting to walk into the gym and see the 60 kids working on the same thing and just getting better and better and better every week. I think that'll be a huge asset if we can keep that program just for basketball and Lewis. And, and I know there's other, other sports we should probably do that with. And I've even talked to athletic director about doing it with older kids as well. Just having that skill base for those kids and bringing them together and not dividing them. It's just, it was a huge, huge win. It's a great program to see. Um, we do all of our marketing in-house. We create all these little guys. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but those are our rectangles cheesy and fun, but that's what we like to do. Um, 
So we've got uh, Louie, Ivy, Zany, and Phil, and they help us market all their programs. Just creating those little characters that gave us something to work with for each thing. So it's a little bit unique. If you see those little squares, you know, the little rectangles, you know, something's coming from us. And we try to blast it all over social media and everywhere we can. Um, so this is just a, a brief list of things that we've done since I've been here. Um, I started January 2015. Cheryl, our senior principal clerk, was in June, and our previous program coordinator started in June 2016. Uh, Cheryl was June 2014. Um, and so these are some of the things we've gotten done in our short time here. We've worked really hard trying to create the Armory um, as just a welcoming space, a clean, a beautiful space, just making the building more presentable, making people come through the front doors, um, just making everything welcoming. Um, so we did that with the Armory. We added, uh, added or expanded over 18 programs just in those few years. And then there was no registration software when I first started. So that was one of the first things we did. Um, <clears throat> we can track revenue, expenses, attendance. We can pull up reports. Um, and then in, when we switched this year to an even more user-friendly one, I've started to reach out to, um, to the um, City Hall with events. And we're starting slowly the process in between all of the other things we have to do and everything changing every week. Um, we're trying to work on getting events to, to use the same process for registration software. That way they'll all be integrated in the same calendar. Um, everybody will work together. We can just look at one space and see what's going on, what's happening. Public Works crews can look in the same calendar. Nobody will have to look in different places. This is just a breakdown of, of the revenues we've done since I've been here. Um, we're looking to have another great year. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of is we haven't really increased um, program expenses, program costs. So the only real program that has gone up um, throughout all of this time is really summer camp, and that's just because of the amount of staff we have and minimum wage. But all the rest of the programs, if you want to do like a regular rec skills and drills program, it's generally $50, and it's been that way, and hopefully we can keep it that way, or even less once we can get some more partnerships and more support. Um, so what do we do next? Hopefully we get the program coordinator back as soon as possible so we can start working on some programs. I've started working with the National Rec and Park Association. There's um, <clears throat> a webinar and some, and some learning on what to do for needs assessments. And that's something we can talk about whether it's just me doing things or if we want to go out and get a professional one like a lot of companies have done. Um, the UNH Department of Recreation Management actually has done a few in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and I've reached out to the coordinator there, uh, the director over there, and he's going to talk with me about some information next week. So I'll have some, some bulk part costs about getting professional needs assessment done. Um, one of the things we started talking about before in this regular budget process was adding more staff, adding the two programs to two programmers to come below the program coordinator. That way, the program coordinator would oversee all of the programs that we have, and then he would have two staff to delegate to be hands-on with the programs. Um, that could free me up to do more special event stuff. So I know we've started to talk about a little discussing, um, continuing integrating special events. And then we want to start evaluating the benefits, implications of future development of a full parks and recreation department, rolling in the, the open space um, division into full parks and rec and integrating everybody together. This is just a chart that I pulled from the National Rec and Park Association. Um, they often do surveys and show what staffing levels are. Um, so the average staffing level for somebody, a community our size for parks and rec is 27. Um, so if you count our two and a half from recreation and you bring in the five from open spaces, that puts us at seven and a half. And that lower quartile number of 14 is the lowest 25% of the country, that's, that's what they have. So we're half of what the lowest quarter of the country are is for staffing for our population size. So we're a little bit under. Um, so now's the perfect time for us to work on changing and coming out of this pandemic and everything better. Um, we've got a public works director who's moving on. We've got the public works operational manager who's out. A vacancy and recreation programs are suspended right now. So I, I think now's the time to start planning for changes. I pulled up this quote from the, the budget from 1983, and it it's kind of sounds like every budget presentation I've been in so far. It's, it's We're always holding the line, and I think you know now's time to, to make some plans for change and see what we can do to, to make this community even better. 
So here's some of my next steps. I'd love to hear what you guys have for comments, questions, concerns. See where we go from here. So I'm going to just take over for a second here. The mayor um, is having some technical difficulties. Um, can we remove the... Um, Dennis, Dennis, we thought we might take comments on this portion and before we get into the fall, because this is more strategic, so we might chat about it here and then we could kind of lay out this fall, which is more, less strategic, more practical in a, in a moment, if that makes sense to the council. Sure. Uh, I'm just going to give the mayor just one second to see if he's able to jump back in here. <laughs> then, I'll, then I do see Councilor Ray and Councilor Cleet, your hands raised. I just want to make sure that you he was removed. Okay. Uh, okay. Councilor Little Joy, can you um, take over uh, you know, the, mayor, the mayor? So I'm going to assist him with his uh, technical difficulties here. I think he had to reboot his computer. Council of Joy. Phew. Here we go. <laughs> okay. And you have uh, Councillor Ray and Councillor Khalid are both uh, have their hands raised. Uh, <clears throat> Councillor Ray, why don't you go first? Thank you, Council President LaJoy. Um, so Jason, thank you so much for this. Um, you know what a what an enthusiastic supporter of REC I am. Um, I have a couple of clarifying questions, um, and then and then I think I might leave the other stuff for when we get into the strategy discussion. But um, are either Lewiston Middle School or LPD still using any part of the armory? What do you mean? Um, I believe the Star Academy was over there and there were also some officers um, using some space on the second floor, I believe. Um, so the, there's some storage available for police when they need it. Um, but other than that, there's no school presence. Okay, great. Um, can you remind us fees for athletic fields, what fund they go into? So if there's, if they're coming from Franklin Pasture, they go into a separate fund that we're going to use to um, work on that because it's a, it's a much larger project. And then all the other ones go into a separate parks um, account. So it's two separate accounts they go into. And the intention of that Franklin Pasture field funds, um, those revenues are to maintain and replace that specific. Uh, uh, yeah, because we're going to have... In, 10 to 12 to 15 years, um, the turf itself will have to be replaced. So it's going to be a, a big major cost that hopefully this revenue will help offset. Okay, super helpful. I know that comes up um, with the school committee all the time. So I just wanted to, to double check on that. Um, sure. Do, 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 um, are there outdoor spaces um, where folks can recreate without reservations? Um, not currently. Um, they can always go play um, unorganized things like that if they want to show up and play on any of the outside fields. Um, we're we're working on hopefully the Hudson property is going to be a, a different property altogether where somebody where people can just show up and play like an open park but set up more for like soccer. Um, we're encouraging everybody to to if they want to do like an organized practice to make sure they get the space to either call over to the rec department to go on our website and fill out the the registration form. Okay, great. Um, how are senior center discussions progressing? I know there was the offer in the new um, housing at Martell School. Um, have you been involved with those? And i um, just wondering what you may have heard so far. Um, I haven't heard much at all. Um, a couple times Lincoln from Economic Development will reach out and we'll have a discussion about, you know, he wants some information about it, um, but I haven't been strictly involved in them in the conversations. Dennis looks like he has yeah, something. Yeah, I, I can I can just add literally uh, call it hut off the presses. Uh, I did get an update from uh, Lincoln Jeffers regarding that he has toured the facility uh, with some of the the senior folks to take a look at it. 
Um, initial feedback is, is in, and I think we'd want a more detailed response, but at this point, I think the initial feedback we're getting is that the Martell space may not work for them from a, for a senior's uh, facility. So um, it just didn't seem like the layout would work from some of the initial feedback again, the, the tour that they just did. But we'll obviously get a much more um, detailed response on that uh, from Link. And okay. Not terribly surprising um, to hear. And then, um, yeah, it was very interesting to see those averages. So thank you for pulling those from the national um, scheme of things. Um, and then one other thing uh, that's just come up a couple times and just wanted to raise your attention, um, opportunities for improved signage and directionality around the armory. Um, I know where I'm going in there, but um, guests from other <laughs> uh, communities may not. And so if there's an opportunity for that, um, definitely let us know uh, how we can support that. And then just one last question, sorry. Um, is there a fund that exists um, to help support, um, especially youth that want to participate in rec activities but cannot afford the, say, $50 registration fee? We don't have a scholarship right now. Sorry, could you say that one more time? We do not. Nope, there's no scholarship right now through us. That's one thing I definitely think we should work at on establishing, whether it comes from operating funds or whether we establish a certain amount of rec activity funds that we're going to plan to go back. Um, I've, I've got forms all, all regular, ready to go. I've got um, um, things that people can fill out. I'm, I'm ready to roll it out. We just need to figure out how we would want to come up with the money. Okay, so funding. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jason. Yep. You all set, Councillor Ray? Okay, Councillor Kalee. Thank you. Um, I have several questions. One is, Jason, can you tell us like the benefits of bringing open space under rec and um, park and rec, making it under one sure. department? I think are, yeah, I think there's a few of them. Um, so right now, a lot of times the, the public works staff for open spaces will check in with me anyway because I do all the scheduling. So if they want specific details, they're already they're already sort of coming to me a lot of times. Um, I know the open space is just a smaller part of the huge highway division. So I think bringing it, separating out from public works will give us the, the time to focus on that specific thing. Um, I know a lot of times I go to trainings through Parks and Rec Association, National, and through our state association that I, I don't think the public works staff do now because they're focused on the entire city and so many other miles and miles and miles of highway. So I think just Breaking it out and having a, a detailed focus will help us improve the parks around the city. I think it'll make it uh, more efficient too, running it through us and with the scheduling person. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Is there like any cons or any like constraints to implementing that right now? I, I think there'll be some costs that we'll have to incur. I, I know Dale's got something to say too. Um, I think uh, we'll have to, I, he and I are gonna have to sit down and look at the physical restructuring of it. I know um, a lot of times winter operations, those guys are doing things that are definitely not parks. So we would have to figure out, you know, whether the parks and rec department would be responsible for sidewalks or what we'd have to do. So there's a lot of little, little logistic things that we'd have to figure out. Uh, Dale, I think you have some stuff to add to. Yeah, I think that's it. And that's one of the reasons we, we looked at that, not this next budget which is probably going to be challenging, but the budget after. There are actually nine, right. nine individuals in the um, open space division, but the open space division, like much of the city, especially in public works, really bleeds over. There's not really an open space division in a bubble. The open space division plows snow. It picks trash throughout the city. It um, works on trails. It um, responds to things like hypodermic needles throughout the city. And it's just a big litany. And um, in the, so in the winter, they're actually on the A-team. So they're running down the road plowing just like every other highway person. Um, in the summertime, because of vacations and a lot of things, they're swapping over. So someone that might be in this morning, um, maybe in the open space division, might be out patching potholes or out <laughs> cutting grass on a vacant lot or doing many things and maybe helping the arborist crew or the sign crew. It's just because it's such a small staff. So as Jason said, it's definitely an admirable goal and we should really work towards it. Um, I think Jason and I really need to figure out how we still fulfill the needs in public works and then we 
make this efficiency and then what are the costs to the city so um, that's definitely something we'll be doing within the next year is going through that and seeing how we can divide up staff better use staff and could that could that occur because it probably really should um, I, I think maybe uh, Heather has something yeah yeah can you hold on just a second Heather I think would like to say something mm hmm are you all set, Heather? Sorry, I'm having the same thing as Councillor Clements mute button. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only other thing is um, initially uh, the parks and open spaces used to be under rec when I first got here, is the duplication of equipment and tools and all of that. That's probably the bigger cost. And one thing that we discovered that some of the equipment wasn't getting fully utilized. So that would be probably another more significant cost to consideration. All set? Um, no, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Dave. Thank you for waiting. Go ahead. So Jason, the, the activities fund that you mentioned, I, I know that you are, I'm also sad in that that position of a program um, program director didn't go through, but that activities fund, do you think that's something that we can support you in hiring a temporary um, program um, person? I think it's something that we could do for for maybe six months to a year, but other than that after that it would it would deplete the funds so as long as we're going to be back to somewhat normalcy and and having it funded through the operating by then um then yes but that's it's a it's a big if and that'd be something that we'd all have to be comfortable with thank you, you. Also, okay yeah. do you have any more questions councillor Cooley? i might later but right now i'm done thank you okay very good thank you are you back, Mr. Mayor? I am, but you're doing such a good job, I just figured I'd wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions or comments from councilors? Okay. Uh, so thank you, Jason, that was a good presentation. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor. I think one of our charges was just to lay out this fall and how we might reopen rec. It'll take us just a minute or two. Could we yep. Jason, just put that on the screen and tell you what we're opening back up and when. All right, so if something goes up on the screen, you may lose me again, so pay attention to Councilor LaJoy and, uh, <laughs> and Dennis, we have to have them look at my computer tomorrow or something. All right, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> All right. Or maybe we could talk through it, Jason, if you can't get it up on the screen. I so. should be all set. Beautiful. Got some anticipated start dates. Um, and we've got our, like, I don't want to say generic, it's not generic, but those are general safety precautions that we're going to use for all the programs going forward, trying to adhere to all the guidelines. Um, so we're, we're trying to start everything. Um, <clears throat> everything will pretty much go on normal as scheduled so far after starting after Labor Day. Um, tumbling and cheering usually happens during the summer at some. Um, so that, that's pretty much the only thing on this list that's really pushed back at all. So Jason, we, we're gonna continue to monitor the governor's guidelines and this is our best hope right now. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Correct. Yep. As long as we say, where we are today, we could, I think we, I feel comfortable we could operate all these things. They'd be a little bit less, um, there'd be a lot less games. They'd be a lot more skills and drills, which is what um, high school athletics and middle school athletics are probably going to go towards right now anyway. Um, so we'll, it'll be, it'll be closer to that. 
Um, the 70 and 60 you see down here for numbers for volleyball is like the total amount of people. So that wouldn't be the amount of people we have in the gym at any one time. Um, we'd be closer to, you know, two or four teams max at MT in the space. So we'd be well under the 50 person um, restrictions that we need to have. Jason, I, I think that is that's it, right? We've... Yep, that's what we got. We got those, that's what we have planned for the fall so far. Council of Joy, um, the the mayor's um, computer has um, not working again. The mayor's so, out again. <laughs> with me right now. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions from uh, any of the councilors? Jason, could you drop the screen, please? Yeah, that's causing the mayor to have to go away. <laughs> I'm here. Easy. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Councillor Ray. Thank you. Um, so I trust you and your staff to to make the right choices here. Um, one thing that just came up, um, a friend of a friend, uh, their softball league has started up again and they were exercising all these precautions. And then at the end of the game, they did the very, um, good team spirit thing and did a high five, high five line. Um, so just <laughs> thinking about other traditions that go along with, um, with these youth, especially sports, um, you know, we're, we're trying to teach good sportsmanship, good sports personship. Um, and I, I think just uh, remembering all encompassing parts, you know, who maybe not having communal food and snacks, um, even though I know we we'll like to pitch in things like that. So um, just thinking of those other considerations. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have our staff come up with some other way to, to celebrate the end of the game. I'll set Councillor Ray. Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't have uh, any questions. Um, I mean, maybe just a few comments. I'm really happy to see the forward thinking that, that the uh, rec is doing right now. Um, and just planning for the years ahead. It, it's very important and I'm happy to see that. Um, also, I know there are a lot of people out there that are pretty anxious about seeing what kind of programming is gonna start up again for, for REC. So um, it'd be nice to share some of that information as well. Other than that, just thank you for all that you and then Mr. Dowdy have done on this and just to you, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, there are a lot of people in town that really like you and, and are really happy that, that you're doing what you're doing. So uh, thanks for everything. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from uh, other counselors? I don't see any hands up, so I guess we're all set. So Jason, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting sure. and uh, very informative. Uh, and thank you for your hard work in keeping things together. Okay, uh, we're all set, thanks again. Anybody else have any questions? That, that concludes the workshop items, uh, Councilor Joy. Yes, I was just gonna say that. I, I think I'm up to that point where it's uh, taken care of the whole program for this evening. So, Mr. President? Yes, go for it. I move to adjourn. Oops, Heather's back. I see Heather's back. <laughs> Do we Nobody need a vote for adjournment from a workshop? We do, we do not. Okay. Luke's Dennis, just trying to move us along. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I think oh, that was are. a hint from Councilor Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'd ask for an adjournment. If, uh, would that be uh, in tune, Dennis, to ask for an adjournment from someone? I think we can just uh, simply announce at this point the uh, workshop's concluded um, and uh, thank everyone for their, uh, their time. It's been a good workshop and we will, uh, we have our next council meeting next Tuesday, the 21st official meeting. Council at seven with no workshop Tuesday? There, there will be a workshop, uh, two workshop items uh, uh, for uh, next Tuesday starting at 6 p.m. Okay, okay, thank you. Sounds good. You've done a very good job, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to my uh, staff. Okay, we'll close we'll close the meeting, folks.
Take care. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you.